collections of some collected formula forms. Thanks a lot. Uh, it's a great to be here. Uh, sorry. Surface of general type has to lie between these two lines. It has to lie in the first quadrant, and it's the variance has to lie to satisfy these two inequalities. This is the, the nuclear line, and this is the bogan mole and the up gal line that Ron mentioned. Uh, here's for, for, for reference, I guess. This is this is line of slope A here. That's that's the same thing. To say that C1 squared equals A pi, if you go through the algebra, that's the same thing as saying that the signature is zero. Things above this line have a positive signature, and below that line, are negative. Uh, and um, you know, if you again just kind of muck around with how these numbers are defined, it's easy enough to see that any smooth four manifold lies below a line of slope ten. 
but a complex surface lies below this line of slope 9. And there's some open questions here. Um, as Ron said, uh, Uh, well, so, for example, does, does every irreducible, say, uh, smooth four manifold have to lie below this line of slope 9? Describe some techniques for constructing uh, manifolds, eclectic manifolds in particular, uh, and, and with the, the object of sort of exploring these um, constraints or, or pushing the boundaries. Uh, so this is there's been a lot of progress uh, in sort of realizing points in this plane by smooth four manifolds. Um, in particular, uh, it's a, it's So there's a lot of names to mention, but in spirit of mentioning people's theses, I guess John L. Park's thesis put infinitely many diffeomorphism types of smooth four manifolds on virtually every lattice point in this, in this region below this line. So, uh, but, uh, so the goal is to find some new, new uh, uh, I want to, well, let me say, I'll, uh, I'll introduce a framework for producing new constructions. So, sort of cut and paste constructions of symplectic format folds. Point being that up till now, while there has been a lot of progress in constructing examples, they've been they've sort of drawn from a very limited set of tools. Um, so basically, the previous tools are, are essentially um, combinations of what's known as a rational lowdown, which I'm not going to say much about. And uh, fiber sum. Those are the tools that people have used in um, various clever ways to, to produce interesting examples. Maybe I'll um, maybe I'll come back to fire a little bit. But, um, so the starting point for this for this framework. Is, is this idea of a left chest vibration. So we've heard a certain amount about left chest vibrations. Uh, to, to recap, I guess, a left chest vibration for us is going to be, uh, so this would be left chest vibrations on manifolds of boundary. So uh, left chest vibration is a smooth moving map. Um, uh, I've been calling it 
post manifold x. with sort of only nodal singularities. So locally, uh, you should have a, the map that should be of this form. Um, so the, the picture is what we've seen before. You have a map here from M to D2, and the regular value or the, the regular fiber is going to be some surface of some fixed genus, which for us is actually going to have boundaries. So let me try to draw a surface of boundary. So this is for, for a regular uh, fiber. And then the singular fibers um, look like what you get if you, if you pinch an essential circle uh, on the surface. So you So the way to think about it um, for us is that you can get a left chest vibration by specifying this surface, this regular surface F maybe. So this is the data compression that Jeremy mentioned. So you specify a surface. This is the regular fiber. And then a sequence of curves on that surface. Uh, and for us, they're always going to be um, essential in the sense that they don't bound the disk. Uh, so simple closed curves. So you, you think of those as corresponding to the vanishing cycles. That's, that is to say that the circles that get pinched when you move to the various uh, critical values. Uh, once, if you know the sequence, so the sequence corresponds to sort of running around the boundary. I guess that sort of corresponds to cyclic order. And strictly, I guess you are sort of supposed to choose a sequence of you know bases of the high one of the complement of the critical values or something, but uh, so the sequence of curves specifies the left chest vibration, and then on the boundary, as, as Jeremy described, you see a, an open book. So the open book uh, is you, you get it by taking that surface, cross with the interval, and then glue up. So you say um, x comma 1 is, a, is identified with p of x comma 0, uh, and then you glue in solid tori, uh, where phi, this is the monodromy, this is the composition of dang twists around these curves. So in particular, the sequence determines the, the vibration, but just the composition of twist determines the boundary. So um, to describe this framework that I'm talking about, uh, I want to give you an example of how to, how to produce such things. So suppose you had a, a collection of, of embedded surfaces in a four manifold. And they, they, 
check according to some graph. So um, here's an example, maybe. Uh, so what, the, what does this mean? Well, the vertices of the graph are supposed to correspond to the surfaces. So for each vertex, you have a surface. Uh, and then you take a, so I have to tell you a genus for each surface in order to specify it. So maybe I'll put some numbers on here. Um, and then the way you, you so I'm thinking of uh, a neighborhood of that sort of this configuration. So you, you, you know that sorry, the vertices correspond to surfaces. The edges mean that those corresponding surfaces should intersect transversely at a single point. Uh, and then to specify the neighborhood of, of, of such a thing, you need to know the sort of the degree of the distance, the degree of the normal bundle of each thing. So that's sort of should be part of the data also. Um, so in my case, these are all going to be negative. So there's this. Um, there's the graph, the sort of so-called plumbing graph. And then I want to tell you how to get a Lefschetz vibration on this, on this neighborhood. Uh, so the way you do this is to, well, <coughs> we've been to carnivals and such where you have these guys hanging around, um, they you know, wear funny suits and they carry balloons. So they uh, start you know, making balloon animals. They start off by inflating their balloons. So you, you do that to the graph here, just, and it gets fat. So you, um, well, some of them will might get fatter than others if you can uh, do this. So I'll try to draw sort of a fat neighborhood of this thing. Uh, now some of them are, um, have high genus, so you, um, wait, so, you, so this has like genus one, and this has genus one, and the other guys are sort of spheres. Uh, and then you, he's just <coughs> twisting it up, right? Um, so you want to put a, put a twist in there, so you might give me a balloon animal, so you twist it, and you put, certainly put a twist in for each edge. And then, uh, and then each edge, each twist that you put sort of counts minus one towards that self-intersection number. So if you look at this genus one piece in the middle here, um, I've got four, four sort of twists that I've marked on here, and it says minus four already, so I'm okay. Uh, this one says it's supposed to have square minus three, and I've only got um, one twist on there, so I, I produce more twists just by introducing a boundary component, which maybe I should use a different color for boundaries, and, uh, <laughs> and then put a twist around that. Uh, and then you have to sort of, well, I guess these are boundaries too. Um, you need to put a twist around each boundary to put the list sort of things fall apart. Uh, and that one, this one has a couple of extra boundary components missing, uh, so there's, some, there's one down here. <laughs> Okay, so then like, you can give that to your kid or something. Uh, so that's how that works. Um, so what have I done for you? I've just told you how to start from a graph. Um, you know, any more and that would have been X-rated. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I was going to do a bulldog, but I couldn't really make a graph. So I told you how to start with one of these polygraphs uh, and produce a, a surface um, with boundary and a sequence of curves on it. Well, okay, I didn't tell you the order on the curves, but in this case, they're all disjoint, so the order doesn't actually matter because the corresponding twist can be. Um, so I've, I've told you exactly a, a Lefschetz vibration when I tell you the surface with a sequence of curves, and the, the point is that uh, the corresponding Lefschetz vibration Uh, 
uh, is diffeomorphic as a four manifold to the, the neighborhood of that uh, plumbing of curves. Maybe I'll give you one more example um, that's a little more pertinent for the applications or the potential applications I have in mind. <coughs> Just to sort of remind you how this works. So you just take a, 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 a sort of a star-shaped plumbing. So what that means is that it's got sort of a central vertex, which is this guy, and then a bunch of legs. There might be a bunch of them, so sort of K legs. Uh, this, this guy here could be any genus, but it should have square minus K. And the rest of these things are, should be, uh, how am I doing this? Genus zero and square minus two. So these chains of uh, minus two spheres hanging off the central vertex. And if you kind of do this inflation thing, uh, so you, you um, blow air into it, and you kind of get some big sort of high genus gadget here, and uh, a bunch of squiggly legs, so this weird looking octopus. Uh, The same, the same number of segments on each leg. Uh, I know that's, that's what that looks like. I think that's there's right. This is this is the octopus that I'll come back to. Um, um do those legs have the same length? Yes. Uh, I guess I should give that length a name. Well, it would still work. It's just you know, this is this is you know the graph can be anything to make this. Um, well, I'm sorry, it can't be anything. But I mean, there there is some there's a couple of basic constraints. So first of all, I had to have you know the square of, the, of each vertex had to be enough that I could use a twist on each on each um, corresponding edge, right? So that there had there's this basic inequality, which is that the the absolute value of the degree is at least as big as the valence for each vertex. Uh, and I'm going to require that, you know, if, if you have equality everywhere, then you'll end up with a surface that has no boundary, and I don't like that. So I'm going to require strict inequality at, at least one vertex. Okay, but anything that satisfies that condition um, will be will be um, reasonable for this construction. Uh, and you know, in particular, it doesn't have to be a tree. And you know, you do whatever you want. Okay. So the the plan is to um, use this to produce to do this cut and paste thing. So if the idea is that you're going to go and find this sort of configuration in a symplectic four manifold, it is to cut it out and replace it by something that has the same boundary. Uh, now to do that, so to You have to know a certain amount of uh, stuff to make to make sure that the um, that the result is still going to be symplectic. Uh, so you need to know well in various approaches, but it helps to know the following. Uh, so it's good to have a contact structure on the boundary. Um, which we do because the you know I just told you how to get a left edge vibration on the whole thing. So in particular, you have this open book on the boundary that determines a contact structure. Um, you also need to know if you're going to be kind of gluing things together. You know, it's it's not enough to just sort of have a contact structure. You need to have some sort of standard collar at least. That's if you want to glue it and produce a symplectic, smooth symplectic structure on the, on the union. You, you, 
need to know something about the collar. And so that's what that is usually encoded by requiring that the boundary be convex in the sense that Jeremy also alluded to, but I don't want to get too far into right now. But. Um, and well, implicitly, there's sort of a compatibility. As soon as you have somebody with convex boundary, that means that what well, it means is there's a certain kind of vector field transverse to the boundary, this so-called Lugal field. That vector field will induce a contact structure, and there's this technicality that the contact structure comes from the Lugal field should be the same as the one coming from the silver books. Check. So these So in the case of streets, an elastic condition on the way to, to get the convex boundary? This, this, this is a condition here. So that's enough? Get the yeah. so, so this, I mean, this in particular will apply that the that the intersection matrix for this graph is negative vector. Is that for the cyclic ones or for any graph? So for any graph, you could feel this delicious variation. For any, yeah, any graph just satisfying these sort of. You know, these conditions on the vertices, sort of it one vertex at a time, it's okay if it has, you probably have to think a little harder if it actually has edges connecting the vertex to itself, self points. You can still deal with it, but I don't know if it's precise thing is enough. But, uh, but the graph can, can have be one okay. So maybe I'll just um, state the theorem to get it out of the way. Uh, so this is uh, so if C is a configuration of symplectic surfaces, satisfy these two things. Uh, then, it, then it has a, then, then there's a left its vibration on the neighborhood, having symplectic fibers. supported by that open book. Okay, so I mean I say there exists a left edge vibration, but it's you know this one I told you how to get. Okay. Uh, So how do you, so this is sort of half of a cut and paste thing. I sort of told you how to cut. So the question is, um, how do you find something to plug back in to get some interesting results? Configuration is um, 
has convex boundary, so it's complement concave boundary. I want to put something else that's con convex on the other side. So there's sort of a complementary issue. But we'll, we'll sort of skirt that question using the following idea. So as I mentioned, um, so that we know that the boundary of the neighborhood is determined by uh, this, the monodromy, right? So that, that, that is to say the composition of this sequence of twists. Suppose your, your, the graph that you start with in this theorem is just a single vertex decorated with a minus 4. I guess it's 0 and a minus 4. OK, then you uh, inflate it. You just get a sphere. And it has some <coughs> four boundary components, which I'll draw this way. I was drawing them in purple before. I guess. So there's a sphere with four holes in it. And then each boundary component is supposed to get a twist. Okay, so this is this is the leftmost vibration that describes the neighborhood of that of that sphere, and it's well, it's been known for a long time. In this particular case, that that sphere has a convex neighborhood. Um, but the point is that this sequence of twists is one side of the lantern relation. So this is this this sequence uh, is isotopic to a product of three twists. Correct order. The corresponding so so this this sequence of twists then I mean it describes the same boundary three manifold but the the left shed's vibration it gives you is different I mean it has a different number of two handles each twist corresponds to two handle and so like for example the other characteristics are different uh, in particular as Jeremy said this gives you some um, rational homology law. So, as a sort of elementary consequence of the theorem, you recover this uh, theorem of, of Margaret Simonton's, that uh, cutting out a minus four sphere and replacing it by a homology ball, a particular homology ball, um, is a symplectic operation. This is this is a rational blowdown. So you cut out cut out the minus four sphere, you get a four manifold of boundary, and you fill it in with this rational homology ball that sits there. So this operation is the rational blowdown. And so that says rational blowdowns are symplectic. Okay, well, so I've shown you, uh, I mean, well, sorry, there was this, this missing piece, which was that the theorem says that this guy has a convex boundary. You need to know that this has a convex boundary, uh, and and you, so you, now you sort of cheat and say, well, this describes a Stein manifold. It's a general fact that Stein manifolds have convex boundaries. Uh, well, so then you say, well, this is a Stein manifold too. Why don't you go out on this work? And the reason is that the Stein the Stein structure isn't the right one to use on the neighborhood of the configuration of symplectic surfaces. Uh, I mean, a Stein manifold doesn't have any essential symplectic submanifolds. 
So it's true that you know this is diffeomorphic to a Stein manifold, but it's, it won't be symplectomorphic to a neighborhood that you started with. So there's something to do to make sure everything works together in this theorem. Um, when am I supposed to finish? Today. Uh, right. So this kind of rational dilemma is symplectic. Um, and from, from all of this that I was just mumbling, you know, this being convex because of the theorem, this being convex because it's Stein, all I needed to do to prove something like that is just say, well, here's this relation, and then you get a corresponding kind of case operation. Uh, so there's some work that I did with Jeremy, um, and uh, and Hisaki Endo. So Van Horn Morris, Isaac Mando, Minis. I suppose I should permute to get the alphabetization right. But, uh, um, so there, there exist other relations corresponding to lots of other rational blowdowns. So the sort of the minus four sphere is the most basic case, uh, but there are lots of kind of fancier configurations that can be replaced by rational laws, and this proves that all of them, many of them are, are symplectic. Not all of them fit this condition, but um, many of them do. Okay, so what about something uh, new? So I hope I'm, I'm, I'm making it clear that what you need to know in order to produce a symplectic cut and paste operation, starting from a configuration of surfaces, what you need to know is sort of the relation in some mapping construct between positive angles. Uh, and if you don't, so your first one-sided relationship would sort of be at a special form where you know, the twists are disjoint, but you know, there are lots of relations like that. Uh, so maybe I'll come back to fiber sums now. Uh, so it's, let me, okay, so let's just talk for a second about ordinary fiber sums. So suppose uh, you have a couple of four manifolds, say x1, sigma1, and x2, sigma2 are four manifolds containing some, some surfaces, sigma 1 and sigma 2, uh, say genus G, and these guys should have normal bundles of, of opposite degree. Uh, so sigma 1 squared is minus sigma 2 squared. Uh, and well, for the purposes of, the, of this talk, I need that not to be 0. Um, Then what can you do? Well, you have these two guys. Uh, this condition means that if you if you excise those surfaces, the neighborhoods from the, of the surfaces, what you get is, is a circle bundle on the boundary of the complement. So this is x1 minus sigma 1, x2 <coughs> minus sigma 2. And these circle bundles are orientation reversing diffeomorphic. Right? So you can uh, say glue them together. And you, you get this thing is, is the fiber sum. So that, I mean, that's what an ordinary fiber sum is. It's actually a theorem of Goff that uh, if those two surfaces are symplectic, um, then the result of the fiber sum is symplectic.
Okay, so I can generalize this as follows. Uh, let's 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 take a look at this octopus again. So it was it just came from this sort of star-shaped plumbing. There are n vertices down each leg, there are k legs, <coughs> genus g in the middle, and that was self-intersection minus k, k being the same as the number of legs. Um, so this gives you um, this left chest vibration that's described in the following way. Well, I'll draw it in a slightly less whimsical fashion, maybe. Boundaries uh, no, are supposed to be purple. So there's some large, large amount of genus in there, or arbitrary amount of genus, I guess. Uh, and there are uh, k boundary components. And the left side vibration, um, you have these sort of boundary curves, maybe boundary 1, boundary 2, up to boundary k. And the monodromy is um, it's the composition of powers of these boundary twists. So if there were and there were n parallel guides along the legs of the octopus. <clears throat> but if you think about left chest vibrations at all, this is um, sort of a familiar fact. Yeah, so the observation is suppose you have uh, let me remember what letters I've been using. Oh, a new one. So suppose Z is a, is a left chest vibration over, over the sphere, so it's a closed one. Uh, and let's say the fiber has genus G. Uh, and it has k sections each of self intersection minus n so the picture would be um, Picture of a left chest vibration, I guess. But except now this is a sphere, and this doesn't have any boundary anymore. Uh, so, but the point is, you you have a, a regular fiber here, which is the surface of genus G, and then you have a bunch of sections. So these are um, S twos uh, of self intersection minus M. Yeah, they're all supposed to be disjoint. Yeah, to make sure. Yeah. Then if you look at the boundary of the complement of the configuration I do, so maybe these are um, S sub 1 up to S sub k, it's called fiber sigma. Uh, so z minus this union, so the neighborhood of sigma and all these sections. Is well, or is or has, uh, like say has a Stein structure for one thing. Uh, so this um, follows from work of, uh, I guess, Akhiluddin Osbachi and also William Pergolini. Uh, it just comes from looking at the handle structure of the complement. Uh, Uh, and so in particular it has convex boundary uh, and it has um, the open book on the boundary so I mean it's, it's you know 
the restriction of the left X vibration to this guy gives you a left X vibration whose fiber now has boundary, where that's where each of those surfaces, sections cut through, now the fibers will have boundary. So there's a left X vibration on the complement where the fiber is sigma with K boundary components, K holes in it, and the monodromy on the boundary is, is just what I wrote over there somewhere. It's this composition of boundary twists. So what am I trying to tell you? Well, so what I'm, what I'm saying is, you know, the electrons vibration on this complement, you know, it, it's got a bunch of vanishing cycles in it. That means that, you know, it's got the monodromy, which is a bunch of, you know, twists around the central curves. But ultimately, their, that, that, their composition is isotopic to this composition. So that means that you're sort of eligible to do a substitution. If you find this octopus, then you can cut it out and replace it by the complement of a fiber and a bunch of sections. So this is what I mean by uh, a singular fiber sum. Well, I was going to take k to be 0, but then of course I'm down to the case that I excluded. But <laughs> morally speaking, if k is 0, you just take out a surface of square 0 and replace it by, you know, just glue it to the complement of some other surface of square 0. But this is sort of a singular configuration in the sense that you're cutting out a uh, surface of the intersection of it. That's what I mean by a singular fiber zone. So the, the consequence is, well, I'll just try to state it a little more clearly. Uh, let's suppose X1 is a symplectic four manifold that contains a symplectic copy of this octopus. So the octopus depends on G, N, and K, I guess. take x minus the octopus and glue it to a complement of the fiber plus a bunch of sections, you get some base inflected. It's, it's sort of interesting to notice that you know these. You could draw this guy sort of as a plumbing also, and it would just look like this. You have a surface of square zero, minus g, and then you have these spheres. Um, each has square minus n, and there are k of them. But you know, in particular, these graphs are not, you know, isomorphic or even like. You know, they're not even combinatorially the same thing, even if you forget the decorations, right? It's sort of interesting that, um, you know, just the, the core surface configuration of surfaces, even forgetting the neighborhood, the core configuration of surfaces aren't just anymorphic. But um, you see that they're, the boundaries of the neighborhood are just anymorphic, or in addition, of course, anymorphic. Um, okay. So you've raised the signature by a lot. Yeah. In, 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 yeah, potentially. Yeah. So uh, yeah, that's what I was going to tell you about now. <coughs> so right, so the, in the last few minutes, I'll get back to that geography question. Um, in particular, the question of whether um, any 
symplectic manifold, say, has to satisfy the bone wall looking at the alum equality that C1 squared can't be about that line of slope 9. So the first question is, uh, well, what, what do all these operations, what effect do, they, do these operations have on the characteristic numbers? So let me just kind of say, um, let's write, um, uh, I don't know if this is a good notation. So you, you can think of a, a geography vector. So this is like chi, chi of x and c1 squared of x. Suppose I have a couple of four manifolds and I do a fiber sum, what 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 happens to the geography vector? Well, so let's let's do the original case first. So the so GOMP's original one. So ordinary fiber sum. So this is the one where you just have, you know. One manifold with, a, with an individual surface in it, another manifold with a surface of the opposite square, and you cut them out and glue together. Uh, so it's it's pretty easy to calculate these things. But if you uh, do a fiber sum like this, then what happens is that you add the geography vectors, and then you get sort of a correction, which has slope eight. Uh, and so I guess it's. Um, g minus 1 and 8g minus 8. So here you are in your geography plane, chi and c1 squared. You have a couple of guys here that you realize that you could do a fiber sum, so you sort of add them together, and then you move a little bit further. So there's x1 and x2, there's the fiber sum, and you go up here to slope 8. Okay. Um, now, if you're interested in this question about producing manifolds with large C1 squared, larger than 9 chi, this is actually bad uh, because it tells you that you're never going to produce something like this if you hadn't started with 1 already. Uh, right? If you don't start above 9, and then you add 2 and go slope 8, you're just going to get worse. And so that's not, you know, it's not useful for that problem. So for so it's, it's luckily so promisingly the, the singular fiber sum is a little bit different. So so suppose you you're doing a, one of these sums along an octopus. And what happens? And the vectors, you get that same correction of slope A. But then you just move straight up a little bit. Let's look at what the number is. Uh, so this is good. <laughs> You're using a lot of homology classes to move up. Right? So that's why you cannot keep moving up. Like this. Once again, if you were not close to the line, you know, the same thing. You're using a lot of homology classes in the sum to move up. So well, somehow, to yeah. it, you should be again somewhere close to. It. You well, you're moving up. You know, by an amount that's proportional to the number of homology classes that you're using. Uh, in fact, it's sort of proportional to their product. So I think it's promising. The difficulty is to, you know, is to find four manifolds that are sort of, you, you don't, you want to start close to the line if you want to have any hope to get above it. Uh, so the problem is that the closer you get to the line of slope nine, um, sort of the harder it is to find surfaces. Uh, and certainly in the algebraic case, there are actual theorems that say that you don't have very many 
minus two spheres if you're too close to this line. Uh, so there's, you know, there's some, you have to get lucky. Or, you have, there's some work to do, but, you know, it's, it's um, yeah. anyway, it seems promising. But uh, maybe just to finish off, I'll do one basic example of one of these things that doesn't have anything to do with this problem of getting above the BMY line, but um, just to show you how to do it. So this is my config. This is actually a, a one-legged octopus, I guess. That looks like this. So this is uh, C, G, K, N, I guess, where G is 1, and K is 1, and N is 2. Uh, OK. So right. So there's my octopus. And then, then I need to find a, uh, a Lutschitz vibration. This, with the same, with, with the fiber of genus G, so another elliptic vibration, that has sections of square um, minus n. Was n two or three? I think I got the numbers wrong. When I worked out this example before, it was going to be <coughs> e three again. Let's just be three, right? <laughs> okay. Well, Forget what I wrote. So anyway, I claim that this is sort of the, the dual thing that you're supposed to glue onto. So there's a torus of square zero, and then you have a cup. You can find a bunch, several sections of square minus three. How many? Two, three. Just one. There's only one left. Okay. Very confusing. Okay. So then you can. Uh, you can do this operation, so you can get E3 glued along the octopus to E3. So Could you explain the second, what's the second picture of E3? This is the fiber section. Oh, I see. Okay. Sorry. I'm now awake. <laughs> so you get a symplectic manifold, um, and you, so you have to figure out what the, um, Characteristic numbers are these guys. This elliptic surfaces and the, the geography vector for E three uh, is three zero. Uh, so you find that the, the vector for this guy is going to be sum of those two plus. Um, well, I said it was it was slope eight, but it was g minus one eight g minus one. If g is one, that's just zero. So I don't worry about that. Uh, and then there's this direction, which is k times n plus 1. And now I have to figure out whether k was n, which one is n plus 1. Suppose n is b, k is 1, n is 2. OK, so it's um, 0, 3. OK, so you get to something 6, 3. So that means, that puts you, um, in terms of this geography plan I drew at the beginning, um, you're somewhere here. Well, so that means that this is a symplectic four manifold, and you know, modulo checking that it's um, minimal. 
it, it violates the Miller inequality. So that means you get um, uh, some symplectic form manifold sitting here where where no algebraic surface can be. So it's, it's not even, it's not much of a equal even to any complex surface. So that's sort of fun, but these days it's not very hard to use those examples, so well, there it is. Uh, but again, anyway, it's this, it's this sort of, this is promising for this, for this um, construction, but I hope I've shown you that, you know, you could go and make your own operation if you want to, just write down a relation. Generalized Noether inequalities that you can conjecture. Right. Right. And of course, none of them are proved, but they have to do with the number of basic classes. No, they I keep going but, lower. But I, don't, I mean, yeah, I don't, I don't think this would be anything interesting from that point of view. But I haven't looked into it hard. I wonder if I could make an editorial comment in favor of four manifolds. So, I. A lot of people these days don't work on four manifolds because they see this intense competition. So Tom mentioned he's not breaking any records. But you know, I think that one reason to work on four manifolds is to produce new constructions, and that new constructions and new ideas are way more important than breaking records. And um, I, I think there somehow has been some kind of bad competition or something that's going on that's keeping people from working on this stuff. And it's the new ideas and new constructions are way more important than temporarily being king of the hill. And that, that's why I think stuff like this is great. Anyway, end of editorial. <laughs> 